Mr. Thomas. <clears throat> Good morning, folks. It is February 3rd, a Wednesday morning. It's 9 a.m. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's virtual hearing on February 3rd. Um, we will initiate this hearing with a call of the roll of the commissioners. We have the hearings manager, Thomas, with us today for the roll call. Certainly, Commissioner Gibbs. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Hackett. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven commissioners present. Great. Um, welcome, everybody. Good to see everybody again. Um, the uh, next or first item on our agenda is general public comment. Um, we have folks sign up ahead of time, and I believe we had one person sign up for this morning's agenda, and that would be Mr. Philip Doe. Um, not sure I'm seeing him in the participant section. You seeing Mr. Doe, Mr. Thomas? I am not at the moment. Okay, um, why don't we move then to our next couple of items and then we will Keep an eye out for Mr. Doe and thinks if, uh, if we see him, we'll give him his opportunity for public comment. Uh, next on the agenda is a short report from Executive Director Dan Gibbs. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs, you are recognized. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone. Just a couple uh, quick updates for you all. We are busy uh, meeting with legislators. The legislative session starts back up on February 16th, and it's um, we'll, we'll see how the legislative session shakes out this year, but every legislator is entitled to introduce five bills, and depending on the positions they have in the legislature, sometimes they have waivers and they can introduce a lot more than that. So if you're a joint budget committee member, for example, you are sometimes introducing you know 30 plus bills and and so we are working with legislators to understand if there are any bills that impact the department of natural resources and so that is ongoing right now and thinking of legislators last week the joint budget committee uh, met and vote on the the wildfire stimulus package that was originally came from the governor and really excited that the Joint Budget Committee members supported that proposal, which included $10 million right off the bat uh, for the Department of Natural Resources to help fund the Wildfire Risk Mitigation Grant Program. That's a, a program that homeowners associations, counties, it's, it's pretty broad on who can apply for that, but it's really geared towards both uh, forest health projects on the ground, defensible space around communities, but also for capacity building. So that could be purchasing, for example, a chipper or even chainsaws, just, just like uh, work that, that needs to be done on the ground. There's also money that is geared towards for, for this supplemental for the watershed restoration grant program and that's administered through the Water Conservation Board. So I feel really good about having some, obviously this has to still go through the legislative process, but to have the Joint Budget Committee's support in this was, was very important, very optimistic that, that this will go through. And then on the, the Department of um, uh, Fire Prevention and Control, they also had a component of the, of the wildfire stimulus uh, fund of, um, that was geared towards buying a um, a Firehawk helicopter, and that is more or less a modified Blackhawk helicopter that can take uh, 11 firefighters, drop them off in, in very remote areas. It can also hold over a thousand gallons of water. It has uh, night operations as well. So that's really, I think, it also exciting to have potentially that in the, um, in the ability for the state to respond to fires. 
Our Parks and Wildlife is also very busy working on the implementation of Proposition 114. That was the, the, the measure that voters supported to move towards a reintroduction of wolves. And we, uh, the deadline for that to reintroduce wolves in Colorado is December 31st, 2023. So that's the ending point. And, and so we're working towards implementing uh, what, what the voters told us to work on. We are starting the process on our WIGs, our wildly important goals for the coming year. It seems like yesterday, yesterday that we were discussing WIGs for, that, that we're involved with right now. But um, believe it or not, we're, we're also you know, looking at um, these wildly important goals, these, these um, measurements, uh, measurement tools, performance measurement tools that we are working to develop for next year. Also, um, I have uh, sad news. Uh, this is very challenging year for avalanches. Um, we have um, a terrible avalanche that, it, that occurred over um, folks, seven folks from Eagle County area were visiting the Ofer Mountain Hut and they went out on a backcountry ski adventure. And out of the seven, four people got buried and um, they were able to um, find one of those four, but we still have three people that are buried. And this is an area outside of Silverton. So um, I urge everyone to really, really be careful this year. Um, if, if there's ever a year to not be in the back country, uh, this is the year to wait it out. It's, it's, it's just been a, a challenging, very terrible year um, for avalanches this year, even though our snowpack is only at 78%, um, the, the, the stability is just really, really bad right now. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, I think that is it for me for right now. Thank you, Director Gibbs, for the report and all the best to those that are out in the country. Um, director Murphy, uh, you are up next with perhaps a quick director report. Very quick uh, uh, report director, or chair, sorry, I'm the director, whatever. Titles are hard today, apparently. Um, just wanted to give a quick update on the rulemaking. We continue to be in the implementation phase. We've launched a bunch of forms. We'll have a couple more forms out later this month, which is exciting. We're in a position to be receiving um, permits at this point in time and working through them and are continuing to meet with industry and other um, key stakeholders to talk about implementation. We've been having twice weekly operator trainings for the last five weeks. Um, next week, we're gonna transition that to one per week, which reflects that we're continuing to work on implementation, but that big push right around January 14th is tapered ever so slightly and to give us all more time um, to be having conversations about the issues that are um, coming up as we connect the dots between different sets of rules. Um, on the staffing and operation side, this will be my last remark actually. John Morgan has stepped in to take over our UIC um, program. If you recall last week, I mentioned that um, Bob Kaler had retired and um, we're very excited to have John join us in that capacity. He comes from um, a different unit. So he's, he's, not, he's new to the role, but not new to COGCC. And with that, I would say director, I'm ha I mean chair, ma'am, twice in the same morning. Um, I would be happy to take questions um, or turn it over to Joel, Jane, and Dave to talk about unitization and 3461-18 unit operations. Great, thank you, Director Murphy. Um, I'm not seeing any questions at this point for either you or Director Gibbs. Appreciate the quick updates. Um, we will continue along our agenda because I still do not see the one person who signed up, uh, Mr. Doe, in our house, and so we will move to staff presentation for unitization and 3461-18 unit operations. Um, this is an ongoing uh, effort by staff to educate commissioners as well as our stakeholders about areas uh, within the purview of the commission. Um, we are continuing in our processes of educating commission. Um, and so with that, uh, we would ask Mr. A.G. Minor Ms. Stanzik and Mr. Andrews to join us. And I would turn to that group to determine who's gonna lead us off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is AUG Minor, and I will go ahead and start. Um, Mr. Thomas, are you able to queue up our slides? Uh, thank you. 
Um, so I will be launching staff's presentation this morning with an overview of the statutory basis for unitization, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Stanzik and to Mr. Andrews, who will provide an overview of COGCC's procedures for processing unitization applications. Um, and then Mr. Andrews will cover the geologic reasons why operators might want to file a unitization application in the first place. So um, before I you know, really begin in earnest, um, I wanna provide sort of a quick overview of why, why we're here. Um, as you just said, Mr. Chair, over the past few weeks, you've received presentations from staff on, on two other categories of applications that operators um, can file with the commission under the act, which are drilling and spacing unit applications and pooling applications. So unit applications are a third category that is allowed by the statute. Um, they're much less common, they're far more complex. So we've essentially saved the most challenging concept for last. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that staff's presentation today, just like the earlier presentation on DSUs and pooling applications, is just a general overview of the statutory, regulatory, and administrative process. So it, it is not intended to address any pending unit applications before the commission. Um, and then finally, I want to give a sort of a quick caveat and overview of vocabulary about what we're talking about today. So units under Section 118 of the Act, are, they're often referred to as state units, uh, and they're essentially an agreement between one or more operators to develop minerals in a, a relatively large area where for some reason it's necessary to coordinate that development between wells due to sort of very various geologic considerations that Mr. Andrews is going to discuss later. Um, and the way I think of them, and to maybe use some terminology that might be more familiar to you after mission change, I sort of think of them as subsurface caps, right? They're a plan to develop minerals over a broad area, but they are really focused on those subsurface considerations, not the surface considerations. Um, my understanding is that the term state unit is really intended to distinguish uh, Section 118 units from federal units, which are approved by the Bureau of Land Management and really serve a different purpose than Section 118 units. And it's a little bit confusing, though, because the State Land Board also has its own system uh, that is sometimes also referred to as state units. So those are not what we're talking about today. Um, and, and finally, sometimes drilling and spacing units are shortened and referred to as, as units in shorthand. Again, that's not what we're talking about today. You already heard about drilling and spacing units. So we are just talking about units that are approved by the Commission under Section 118 of the Act. So with that, um, next slide, please, Mr. Thomas, and I will go ahead and begin. So I'm going to be walking us through each subsection of Section 118 of the Act. Uh, please bear with me because it's a fairly long and frankly confusing statute. It has been essentially unchanged since it was adopted as part of the original act in 1951. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it's just been amended twice, once in 1961 and once in 1963. Um, so on the screen, you can see subsection one, which I've broken out into three components that are highlighted in green, red, and blue. The green section identifies three types of permissible unit agreements, which are for pressuring, recycling, and other. Uh, and Ms. Stanzik is going to provide a little more detail about what each of those operations are sort of in practice later in the presentation. Skipping down to the blue text, subsection one also automatically gave retroactive approval to any units that predated the passage of the Act in 1951. And then finally, in the red text, the General Assembly declared that unit agreements don't violate antitrust principles so long as they're entered into for the purpose of conservation to increase ultimate recovery of oil and gas and prevent waste. And it's important to note that the term conservation here refers to conserving subsurface oil and gas resources, essentially reducing the waste of those resources through inefficient production techniques. Um, it's not talking about conservation as we tend to use that term today to refer to environmental protection. So next slide, please. Um, you might be asking yourself, why was the General Assembly worried about antitrust when it adopted the statute in 1951? So as you'll hear about throughout the presentation this morning, a sort of overriding theme of unit agreements is that they tend to be cooperative agreements that involve multiple operators that each have a right to develop minerals in a contiguous area. So those are operators you might otherwise think of as, as competing with one another to develop minerals, um, especially in a sort of rule of capture scenario that would have potentially predated the act, right, where people were racing to develop minerals um, and drain a pool before someone else. So Whenever you think about cooperation between or companies that might otherwise be competitors, um, that, of course, can raise some antitrust concerns and in at least one case, potentially some others, 
in the late 1940s, the federal government did actually bring antitrust actions against oil and gas companies that were uh, cooperating with one another in what we would now think of as a unit development um, in Louisiana. So as a result, many states did adopt or amend their oil and gas statutes in the early 1950s, including Colorado, to make sure that they specified that a, a unit agreement doesn't violate antitrust principles because those unit agreements are really serving a public interest. So um, there's a general recognition that there are some situations where the geologic nature of the formations being produced really do require collaboration to efficiently produce minerals and maximize recovery and prevent waste. So state courts have generally upheld these statutes, um, just like the North Dakota case that I've exerted here, as being a lawful exercise of state authority to further the public interest increasing the ultimate recovery of oil and gas and preventing waste. So next slide, please. So moving on now to uh, subparts two and three of section 118, section two really just allows people to file an application with the commission for a unit agreement. Um, and then section three provides the standard that the commission will apply in just determining whether to approve or deny um, a unit application. Um, and it's a two part standard. The first is that the commission has to determine that the unit operation is reasonably necessary to increase the ultimate recovery of oil and gas. So without the, the unit agreement, there would be less recovery of, of the resource. Um, the second component is that the value of the additional recovery of oil and gas exceeds the additional costs of the unit agreement. And this is a somewhat unique consideration under the act. It's, it's really one of the only places where the commission is instructed to sort of uh, look under the hood to, to peel back um, and look at the actual financials underlying the proposed operations, really consider that economic side as it's approving um, unit operation. So next slide, please. Um, subsection four of section 118 is probably the, the longest and most complex section. Um, it has nine subsections um, within itself. And what it is, is it really identifies sort of the application requirements, what has to be in a unit application that goes before the commission. Um, so the, the first part is, is pretty straightforward. It has to just describe the pool that is being targeted, and we're using pool here to refer to a, a subsurface um, uh, pool of oil and gas. Um, that pool has to have already been determined to be productive. So there likely has to have been at least an exploratory well drilled already to determine that there is, in fact, oil and gas in the pool that can be produced. Second, it has to describe the contemplated operations. Um, this is just my paraphrase here, but you can imagine that that has to sort of describe how is this unit agreement going to develop the, the oil and gas within the unit. Third, it has to allocate the oil and gas produced in the unit among the different tracks within the unit. So you can imagine that a unit's a pretty large area. There are already potentially lots of mineral owners within a, a smaller grouping like a DSU. And so within a bigger uh, grouping like a unit, there are quite a few mineral owners and there's this idea that oil and gas produced anywhere from the unit sort of counts towards the whole unit, right? So we're grouping it all together. And that means there has to be some determination of what percentage of the ultimate oil and gas produced from the entire unit really gets allocated back to each individual mineral owner. So there can eventually sort of be a fair payment um, based on what's produced. Next, there has to be a provision for credits and charges between the owners based on how much they invest in the overall costs. Um, there's some idea that different owners and potentially different operators will contribute sort of differently in terms of their investments. Perhaps some will contribute equipment, perhaps some will contribute financing, and that all needs to be explained in the application. Um, there also has to be an explanation of how costs are going to be determined and sort of charged among all the different owners. Um, and actually the statute expressly requires that to sort of have a contingency plan for what if someone can't pay and sort of instructs that there has to be a plan for essentially selling any of the assets that they're contributing to the overall unit if they're unable to make their contribution. Um, the next one, subsection F is, is an optional one, but if, if this is something that the, um, the owners and operators coming together in the unit choose to consider how they're going to sort of finance anyone who can't necessarily cover the payment on their own. Uh, next, there has to be a plan to supervise the unit operations. That's essentially who's going to be calling the shots, right? Who's going to be making day-to-day -day decisions about the operations. This is complex because the statute does require every owner to have a essentially proportional vote on those operations based on what percentage of the overall costs that they're going to bear. So. 
Um, it's, a, it's a complex governance structure. Maybe you think of it like a, a homeowners association or something, but where everyone gets a vote based on the overall share of property that they own within the unit. Um, so part H is more straightforward. That, that's really just saying when the unit operation will st start and when they will terminate, there has to be some fixed um, end, either end date or sort of it will terminate when there's no longer oil and gas or a certain amount has been produced. And then finally, anything else that is sort of necessary for the commission to know. So next slide, please. Uh, so now that we know what has to be in the application, section five kind of goes through the, the process for the commission's approval. Um, and here, there are a couple of complex things that again, we don't really see in other parts of the act. So the, when, the, when the commission issues an order approving unit operations, it actually can't become effective until there is a unit plan that is signed by two different groups of people. So the first one is that 80% of the people who are going to cover the costs of developing a unit have to agree to the unit agreement for it to become effective. Um, so in general, you can probably think of those as operators, right? Like in, in general, an operator is going to be someone who's contributing the costs, they're bringing the capital to conduct the development. But as you heard last week, sometimes that, that's not the case. There could be actual mineral owners who also choose to contribute to those, those costs as well. Um, and then second, um, essentially the owners, and I, I simplified the statutory terminology here, they're sort of a, a more complex group of people um, with various legal statuses, but in general you can think of it as the people who actually own the mineral rights, 80% um, of them also have to agree. So there, there has to be this sort of 80% agreement, both of the people who are covering the costs and then 80% of the people who are going to sort of receive the ultimate royalties from the development need to each agree before the commission's order can become effective. Um, once 80% of each of those groups agree, then the commission has to make a separate finding that 80% that of each group has approved the plan. And at that point, the unit can become effective. Uh, the statute sets essentially a, a six month window for this all to happen. Um, the commission can have supplemental hearings during that period. And if there is not 80% approval from each group within six months, then the commission's order approving the unit will be sort of automatically revoked. Um, unless the, the applicant can make a showing of good cause, they have to come to the commission and show that there's some good reason why that time frame can be extended. So next slide, please. Um, and then I've, I've just put the remaining, I guess, seven subsections here. Um, I think each of these are a little more straightforward or, or self-explanatory. Um, so I'm not going to sort of bore you by running through them in detail. This has already been a lot. I just want to sort of quickly draw your attention to two of the ones that I think are the most important. So highlighted in red there, section nine, uh, that establishes that operations on any part of the unit count as operations for the entire unit. So this, this gets back to the idea again, that once production is unitized, there's this idea that oil and gas produced from anywhere within the approved unit sort of counts as being produced from the entire unit. So even if the, the minerals that are actually produced come from over here, if someone owns a lease, has a lease to develop minerals over here that is also within the units, that counts as if those minerals were produced, right? Um, and that's because there's this recognition that, that everything in the unit is sort of linked for purposes of production. Um, but that also has a, a legal implication um, because it means that the, the operator over here whose minerals were not physically produced, um, they're still fulfilling any obligations they have under their lease to, to hold the lease by production. So a lot of leases are, are held by production. There, there is an agreement that the lease will terminate if, um, if oil and gas is not produced in a certain period. So if that lease is part of a unit and that unit produces from anywhere in the unit, then that lease would count as being produced. Um, and then in, in blue text below section 12, um, it just clarifies that commission orders that approve units do not result in the transfer of title. So we, we've talked a little bit about title, right? That, that is who actually owns the mineral rights. We often say own it in fee, you know, sort of who, who the property interest belongs to. That's different than who leases it. It, it may be different than who's a, a, a working interest owner. And section 12 clarifies that when a unit gets approved, that doesn't mean that suddenly the, the title for all of the minerals within the unit are, are unified. Different people still separately own title to each of those, those uh, minerals within the unit. It's just that they've been grouped together for purposes of production. 
Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Stanzik and Mr. Andrews um, so that you kind of know the framework of the statute that we're talking about and they will give you the details of how this actually works. Thank you, AAG Minor, for <clears throat> that legal introduction to state units. Um, looking to see who's up next. Ms. Stanzik. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Minor. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Jane Stanzik, the Permitting Manager here at the Commission. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just to summarize, um, the Commission's approval of unit operations or unitization, the order creates a state unit, it approves the agreement for unit operations, it prescribes the plan for the unit operations, and it is effective only with the written approval of 80% of the owners within the unit. And um, again, to reiterate what Mr. Miner said, these state units created by this commission are different than those created by the state land board. Next slide, please. So a state unit is not the same as a drilling and spacing unit or DSU. I'll highlight some of the differences between these two types of units and the commission orders that create them. Next slide, please. A DSU is designed to prevent waste, to prevent the drilling of unnecessary wells and to protect relative rights. A state unit is designed to increase the ultimate recovery of oil and gas. For both a DSU and a state unit, the order identifies the lands within the unit and the geologic formation or formations to be developed. The spacing unit establishes the maximum number of wells, the unit boundary setback, and the interwell setback for any wells drilled within that unit. Spacing orders do not establish an operator for the unit or any other operational details. Any of the mineral owners within a DSU can drill wells with approved permits, of course, and they can voluntarily pool their interests or apply to the commission for a pooling order. The unitization order establishes numerous details of the unit operations. These are prescribed in the unit operating agreement and in the operations plan that are part of the application and are approved by the order. Those details include the allocation of oil and gas volumes to each lease within the unit, the financial and accounting procedures to be used, the supervision and decision-making process, and the commencement and termination of unit operations. Now, Dave Andrews, the COGCC engineering manager, will explain some geologic and engineering aspects of unitization. Thank you, Ms. Stanzik, and next slide, please. Am I having microphone issues? We can hear you okay, Mr. Andrews. Okay, thanks. So um, again, good morning, commissioners. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stanzik. Uh, for, today's, for today's presentation, I will review some illustrations to show how unitization has worked in the past. Um, I say in the past because unit, unitization orders have been rare in the 15 years that I've been with the commission. Um, many orders were established decades ago when older conventional oil and gas reservoirs were converted to a water flood. Um, as uh, Mr. Miner alluded to, and Ms. Stanzik also, um, the main intent of this type of unit is to maxim maximize recovery of the resource. Uh, this can be done with uh, field practices. Uh, so ordinarily there is one uh, operator that operates the unit in the field uh, while there may be other operators involved. Uh, usually it's just um, uh, one set of field people. And that helps um, uh, provide consistency in the operations as uh, the uh, pumper and the operator staff go from lease to lease. Um, this also improves uh, the potential for reservoir engineering uh, because the reservoir engineers for the unit are looking at the unit as a whole as opposed to just their portion um, of that unit. 
um, an indirect result from formation of a unit may be reduced surface impacts. And this is because the production equipment and the infrastructure for the unit um, tend to be consolidated into, um, you know, potentially one tank battery for the unit or at least um, multiple centralized tank batteries. Next slide, please. So again, many of the units that have been formed in the past were based on um, older conventional sandstone reservoirs. And um, in this example, I will first run through um, the slide showing how a state unit might form. Uh, second, I will revisit the purpose for a class two underground injection control well and the special type of UIC well used for enhanced oil recovery. And last, I will explain how uh, oil is currently produced from Colorado's classic case for an enhanced oil recovery project, the Rangeley Field. Let's start with this example showing operator A in the northern portion of an oil and gas field that operates the blue lease, which consists of portions of section 16, 17, 19, and all of section 20 for a total of about uh, two and a quarter square miles. Operator B's lease consists of the green area shown in sections 28, 29, and 30 in the southern portion of the field. Uh, the lease lines are fairly straight following blue section lines or quarter section lines. Next slide, please. However, geology is not all about straight lines. Uh, for conventional sandstone reservoirs, the field boundaries are often the result of geologic structure that buckles originally flat-lying sedimentary layers into folds, domes, anticlines, and synclines. These are structures that result from lateral compression of the rock, um, often related to formation of mountains in Colorado. This slide shows a few of those features. The contour lines within the field boundary and the uh, brown colored area could represent a structure map showing lines of equal elevation at the top of the reservoir rock formation. Or they could be an isopac map showing the thickness of the formation throughout the field. Operators will submit both types of exhibits with a unitization application. The purpose of these exhibits is pro to provide sufficient evidence to establish the remaining oil in place in the reservoir at the time of the unit application to show that fair and equitable shares of production will be distributed to the unit operators and the mineral interests during operation of the unit. Next slide, please. This slide shows that the unit boundary lies outside of the geologic field boundary from the last slide. The shape appears blocky as the unit boundary generally follows a survey grid. Next slide, please. You should recall from our recent 800 series rulemaking that enhanced oil recovery wells are a special type of underground injection control well that is permitted as part of a state unit to improve hydrocarbon production from a reservoir in the later stage of the life of an oil and gas field. Next slide, please. The Rangeley field was first drilled and produced in the early 20th century with much of the field development occurring around World War II to support the war effort. In the second half of the 20th century, the operator permitted and implemented a secondary water flood followed by a tertiary enhanced oil recovery using a water alternating gas or WAG process with water and carbon dioxide. Although util unitization has not been frequently, <clears throat> excuse me, lately, in the future, operators may explore EOR concepts with unconventional resource plays, such as the Niobrara Formation. Now I would like to return this back to Ms. Stanzik to wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. I will now describe the application and approval processes for the creation of the state unit and then the permitting process for operations within an approved state unit. An operator that desires commission approval of a state unit must file a hearing application. According to the statute, the application includes the unit agreement, 
the unit operations plan, and testimony in support of the necessary necessity for unitization to increase the ultimate recovery of oil and gas, as well as the prof profitability of the planned operations. If the unit operations will include injection for enhanced recovery, the application must also include all the information required by Rule 811. By statute, the unitization is not effective until the agreement has been approved by 80% of the owners. If the commission approves the unit prior to the approval by 80% of the owners, the operator will apply for another hearing to present the approvals to the commission. If, if the approvals are not obtained within six months, the unitization order is revoked. Next slide, please. The oil and gas operations within a state unit are permitted in the same way as all other oil and gas operations. Oil and gas development plans, Form 2As and Form 2Bs, will be submitted for commission approval according to Rules 303 and 304. Wells will be permitted according to Rule 308. And if the unit operations include any injection wells, those will be permitted according to Rules 803 and 804, requiring the Forms 31 and 33. Thank you. Do you have any questions for us? Thank you, team, for the presentation. I see that Commissioner McGowan has an initial question. Chair, can I make a couple of big picture? Sure, Dr. Answers? Murphy. Great, thanks. Sorry, I didn't um, coordinate very well, but I just wanted to kind of reemphasize a couple of things that are important from today. One is that whether it's a drilling and spacing unit or a unit pursuant to 118, it's the plan for the subsurface. And that is com and complements any cap or OGDP or 2A, which is a plan for the surface. And we, these processes need to run together, but they do have different functions. And so I think that's an important piece to keep in mind. And then the other piece, I know that um, Mr. Andrews touched at a very high level about some very complicated concepts of engineering and geology. We wanted to introduce those today, recognizing that um, a future date might be more appropriate to talk about um, anticlines and reservoirs and water floods and as, as those become relevant to the conversation. So I just wanted to acknowledge that that was a really high touch and it was intentional and that we would, we'll get into more detail as those um, issues or questions become relevant to the work before this commission. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that too. Um, and with that, I will stop talking and um, turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, an initial, go ahead, Commissioner McGowan. I, I have a follow-up question as well. Go ahead, I'll go ahead okay. and then I'll go after you. You um, know I always have questions. Director Murphy, AAG Minor, Mr. Andrews, Mr. Stanz, kind of an initial question. So SB 19181 um, made some alterations to drilling and spacing unit, I believe, um, with regard to looking at health, safety, welfare, environment, wildlife resources, et cetera. Um, but it didn't make any changes to section 118. And so how does that play into the sort of downhole sort of spacing that's happening under a state unit issue? Mr. Chair. Oh. Oh. I, I, hey, I, I Minor. Go ahead, Joel. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things to note there. So, so as you, as you are correct, the Senate Bill 181 did add a provision uh, to section 116 of the act, which notes that public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources have to be considered in the approval of the drilling and spacing unit. It, it did not make a similar amendment in section 118. Um, however, that, that's not the only thing that Senate Bill 181 did, right? It, it also changed the legislative declaration of the act, um, section 102.1a1 um, to make public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources a sort of overriding consideration in, in the commission's overall mission. Um, and it also added section 2.5a to the um, to subpart 106, which, which similarly makes public health, safety, and welfare a sort of overriding consideration um, in commission decisions. So I, I think that how that would really play out in practice really gets to what Director Murphy just said, which is that 
the, the unit is, is truly a, a subsurface plan, right? Um, and when we think about it, I think a lot of environmental protections in the subsurface, um, we are, we generally think about the form two, right? The commission went through the well bore integrity rulemaking making to ensure appropriate isolation of groundwater formations and hydrocarbon formations. Um, and then when we think about surface resources, of course, we're all very familiar with rules 303, 304, uh, 306 and, and 307 that make public health, safety and welfare consideration and the approval of a, a Form 2A and an OGDP. So I, I think in, in practice, that's probably where those changes from Senate Rule 181 would really be considered because an operator can't develop a well um, or build a location just by obtaining a union agreement, right? Um, they, they need to also go through those other stages of the permitting. But if there is some reason to consider public health, safety, and welfare um, in the actual approval of, of or, or denial of a unit agreement, I, I do think that section um, 106.2.5a and also the legislative declaration would provide potentially grounds for the commission to make that consideration. Thank you, AAG Minor, for that uh, clarification. Director Murphy, did you have anything to add? Wise. <laughs> Commissioner quiet. I have a couple questions. I, I think my first one is I, I'm trying to, I'm, I still am struggling with why you would apply for um, a state unit in, in instead of just a regular drilling and spacing unit. What, it, what would be the benefit of that? Um, so at first I was thinking because you could do a larger area and you don't have to develop all of it at the same time, even if you just are developing in one piece of it, the, you're considered as starting work on the whole, the whole space. So I'm wondering if anyone has just can fill me in and explain to me what would be, why you would apply for a state unit instead of just the drilling and spacing units that we've been seeing as in our time as commissioners. And then my second question was whether or not there was some sort of an expiration or a time limit for, and I think I need a, I think I need a reminder for regular drilling and spacing units also, do they expire if something hasn't happened on that in that geographic area within a certain time frame, or are they open ended. Commissioner McGowan, I'll, I'll start and then if Mr. Andrews, Ms. Sanzik or Mr. Minor want to add to it. I welcome that my the answer to your second question is the easiest and the short answer is historically no there has not been a um, cutoff for drilling and spacing units if no operations have occurred that being said drilling and spacing units have often been amended and that's why a number of the drilling and spacing unit orders get complicated you have to talk about how other orders in the lands and affecting those minerals may be affected or impacted or not affected or impacted so um no is the answer to the second question. The first question is a little bit harder for me to answer um, and maybe appropriate for um, some of my colleagues or others to think about answering. To me, the advantage of a unit that I've seen when it's come before us in the seven-ish years or so I've been involved um, is really dictated by the geology. There's a unique geologic feature or a unique way of producing the minerals, but that's not always true either. And so, it, again, if we think about looking at units versus drilling and spacing units versus units under um, section 118 of the act, it really is about understanding the geology and what the plan is and, and how it can be developed and complement with the surface. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I also have a pretty very narrow view of oil and gas development in Colorado. It's been largely um, dictated by, you know, 1280s. Well, it started at 640s and now 1280s with horizontal development of the Codella Niobrara and the DJ Basin. There's been a lot of different development across Colorado um, and four different formations. And so that's the other piece, you know, we've, we've seen a lot in one area, but there are lots of other pieces that go into understanding why the geology would drive a unit operation versus a drilling and spacing unit. So th that's a really long winded meandering answer. Um, but to me, it really is driven by those questions of geology and engineering um, and probably leasehold interest, um, recognizing that achieving the 80%, I think, can be a more difficult burden for unit operations. And I think it provides um, a more complicated conversation for mineral rights holders to have about how to develop their mineral rights. Um, I don't know. Thank you, Director Murphy, for that, for that answer. 
does Mr. Stanzik or Ms. Stanzik or Mr. Andrews desire to add in to any of that? Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just add that, you know, up until this point in the commission's history, it's been mostly regulatory driven. And that's why the majority of the units that we have seen are related to underground injection control. So, you know, the rules require establishment of a unit um, when there's a water flood or when um, enhanced recovery operations are proposed. Um, one example, though, on the flip side um, that I saw when I was looking into this issue this, this week would be like international waters. So let's say you have two different countries um, and their international boundary extends some distance offshore and a new discovery of a field is um, basically splits uh, across or straddles that international boundary. Uh, the first thing they, they would have to do, the, the two countries, is to come to an agreement on how to essentially share that resource. And that would be an example, um, although that's somewhat regulatory driven too, but um, more in the interest of uh, the mineral owners as opposed to two different operators coming together um, where there might be more competition and less interest in getting together to operate a field. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Commissioner McGowan, follow up. Sorry. I, um, uh, so going back to, I think, some discussions we had when we were having our, our 118, 181 hearings, if, if I have applied for a drilling and spacing unit and it's been approved by the commission, but let's say um, the economy is not doing well, so I haven't done anything on that area for a, a significant amount of time, is there a certain amount of ownership that goes with that approval or can another operator say, come in and apply, and this goes back to this conversation or questions that I had last week about whether or not you can have two approvals for the same spacing unit. If someone has already gotten an approval for a unit, but nothing's happened on it, can another operator come in and apply for that same unit and then it gets amended? Because they now they are like, we're ready to go and nothing's happened in this space until now. So I'm a little, like, it. I'm gonna go back to the conversation we've had about like, um, are you affecting someone's mineral rights if you've applied for a unit or pooling, but you but you haven't done anything for a significant amount of time? I'm trying to understand what kind of what kind of privileges you have if you've applied for a unit. Does that make does it make sense what I'm asking? It, okay, I would like to ask some clarifying questions, right? Like, um, one, I think we need to probably parse apart pooling from spacing. Okay. Um, and then also talking about units is, units under 118 today versus drilling and spacing units because they're they're slightly different functions. And for drilling and spacing units, um, they have not historically designated operatorship. So anyone that owns minerals within that unit, once those lands are spaced, can come in and develop the minerals that have been spaced in accordance with that drilling and spacing unit order. For state units or for units under 118, I think there is a contemplated operatorship component. Um, and that's part of the, that is in part because of the unit agreement that mineral owners are signing onto to say, yes, we want our, our minerals developed in this way. Um, and then the one thing I do need to correct, um, I got help from afar, is that under new rule 311, drilling and spacing units will expire. Um, I too am trying to make sure I connect all my new neur neurons to the new rules. Um, so I did um, misspeak on that um, point earlier. Mr. Chair, if I can yeah, add a, a, minor, please. a couple of things just to sort of bring us back to the, the, the section 118 unit discussion, Mr. McGowan. So um, th there is a provision in section 118 that does allow for amendment of a unit to sort of, um, uh, it, it's a part six. It's one of those things that I had on that big slide at the end that I skipped through because I thought maybe we could not, not touch on it, but um, it does allow for amendment of an existing unit. Um, and that, that sort of contemplates that someone could propose a new unit that includes an, an old unit, but 
obviously you still need to get everyone involved, including sort of the operator, 80% of the people involved, operators and owners to sign on to the new um, proposal for, for the amendment, right? So um, I'm not sure that sort of the situation you contemplated would necessarily arise under part six. Um, and then in terms of the actual termination of a section 118 unit, um, as I mentioned, um, under subpart 4H of section 118, um, it does actually require that the commission order uh, for the unit to, to have a termination date, right? It has to have a start and end date. So it's not subject to that 311 expiration process that the director Mickey just mentioned, but there should be some contemplation though. I, my guess is that it's probably not a date. I don't think it would say this ends on July 1st of 2030, I think you would probably say this, this ends when there's no more minerals to be produced. Um, and while I have the floor, just to kind of, I think when you frame the initial question of could someone propose a unit to sort of hold an area by a development, by developing one area, but not developing the whole thing, um, I, I think that that's really what a, a federal unit does, right, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so if you think about, I mentioned the federal units are different, right, um, and, and of course, BLM is both is in a, a very different position than COGCC because it is both the mineral owner and the lessor, right? So it, it owns the minerals that it's leasing and it's regulating their development. It does lots of things that COGCC doesn't do. So um, right, my understanding is that with federal units, multiple federal leases, so BLM will, will issue leases and then an operator can apply for a unit to combine those leases and then potentially hold a larger area by production if they don't have plans to sort of simultaneously develop all the leases within the unit. So I, I won't pretend to be an expert there, but I do think that that model you referenced sounded a little more to me like the, the federal unit process than the state unit. So I will uh, turn it back over to others. I'm sorry for that long answer. Hey, do you mind or could, if I could ask a follow-up question on that um, with regard to the DSU um, there's a specific percentage, right? That, or, and am I getting this confused with pooling? But with regard to this situation, it's it, it says eighty percent that has to agree. But it 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 seems like, if I listen to your slides correctly, that that eighty percent does not have to be sort of upfront. Like they don't have to have eighty percent in order to apply, and they can apply with a less than eighty percent, and then they've got a period of time to go get the eighty percent to sign off. Is it, did I get that right? That, that's correct. So it, there needs to be 80% agreement to, to the ultimate agreement, um, essentially as approved by the commission from, from both the mineral owners and um, the operators, right? I'm, I'm oversimplifying mm -hmm. here, but the people contributing to the costs of, of, of developing and also the people who sort of own the minerals being developed, right? Um, so that both there needs to be 80% of both groups. So that can occur after the commission approves the order. Um, and I, I think that that makes sense because there, there are many provisions of section 118 that sort of allow the commission to maybe alter a little bit the application or, or sort of resolve a question that's that's undecided at the time an application is made. Um, and so I, I think that that sort of acknowledges that it, it there will not always be sort of complete agreement up, up front because sort of what what ultimately happens could change throughout the course of the commission's process, right? Um, there, there are a couple sort of subsections that, that in nuances where the commission might not ultimately adopt what an operator proposes or um, where the operator doesn't have to come with it with a final plan on some of sort of like the cost allocation questions. So I, I do think that that's probably why that's that's in place. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, AG Minor, for those uh, clarifications. And just to make sure that I'm, I'm really clear on that, because um, I had a similar question. So. So they can apply, someone can apply for the unit um, without the 80% um, in hand, uh, but they cannot initiate any operations within that unit um, until they have the 80% or as part of that plan for the unit. Is that correct? That, that is correct. So I'm just going to read the language of, of subpart five, which I think I uh, sort of excerpted in my presentation, but I, I do think the language is important. So subpart five says that no order of the commission providing for unit operations shall become effective unless the plan for unit operations prescribed by the commission has been approved in writing by 
80% of each of those categories. So the idea is the commission's order approving a unit agreement doesn't become effective until there is in fact an agreement of 80% of each of those categories. And Sorry, I was muted. Go ahead, Ms. Danzig. Well, and, and Mr. Miner, not only does that um, approval have to be obtained, but the applicant would have to come back to the commission for essentially to say, here, we have 80% and the commission then agrees. And then the, or the order would be effective. Is that right? Can I aid you, Miner? Yes, so that's correct. So part five also provides for that. Um, and, and for the termination of the commission order approving the unit if 80% doesn't occur within six months. So. Thank you, Commissioner Najapa. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful, uh, both Ms. Stanzik and AG Minor. And I'm um, so then they they still have to provide, I mean, kind of going back to what um, Director Murphy was saying with respect to the, the unit being more of a subsurface, you know, sort of agreement and plan, they still have to come back to us for the OGDP for every well, well that is drilled within. And so we would hear about every single OGDP within the unit, correct? Yes, everyone seems to be nodding their heads up and down. <laughs> Commissioner Messner, then Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a couple of questions. So I think uh, Chairman Robbins had asked on that <clears throat> initial question, if they do not have the 80% and they intend to get the 80%, is there a timeline associated between when they, uh, when they apply for the uh, unit and when they have to secure the 80% prior to moving forward? Is there a timeline associated with that or that can be indefinite? And AG minor. So, so the, there is a there is a timeline. The the timeline is six months. That begins when the commission approves the order. So the, the timeline doesn't begin when the application is filed. It begins when the commission actually approves the um, application. Um, obviously, that's essentially a provisional approval, provisional on getting that agreement. So it's, it's six months from the date of approval. Though, as I mentioned, the statute does provide that the operator can seek an extension of that time um, for good costs. Okay. And that approval is revoked, right, after that six months? Correct. Thank okay. you. Commissioner Gonzalez? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so when, when there's an application for a, a state unit that comes before us prior to the written 80% um, or the written agreement from 80% of the both owners and of operators, um, does that application come with the proposed hearing or, or with the proposed unit agreement that would bind those, um, those owners and operators is the first part of my question. The second part of my question is what notice is provided and who can participate in the hearing um, for the application of the unit? Looking to see who wants to unmute themselves to answer those questions. AG Minor. Oh, I, I unmuted to suggest that maybe uh, uh, Ms. Steenzik can answer sort of that, that first component potentially, um, or, or Director Murphy, but um, to the, the second component of your question, Commissioner Gonzalez, um, well, uh, I think it's 504B3 does, governs the, the notice that must be provided um, as a part of the, um, the unit application to the commission, and, and that does require notice to, I believe, all mineral owners with, within the unit, right, everyone who would be included in the 100% to get to that 80%. Um, and the, there's no specific rule in terms of who may participate in the hearing, um, but I, it would be governed by the general rule 507A that establishes who an um, affected person would be, which I think would sort of obviously include all of those um, mineral owners and operators whose agreements need to be secured. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Stanzik for the first part of your question, if that's okay. Ms. Danzig. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, yes, the statute actually specifies that um, the operating agreement and the operating plan, which I have some overlap, um, are part of the application, the hearing application for unitization. Um, and in terms of notice, um, I think that there's additional notice 
required by the 800 series um, for the, if, if the uh, proposed plan includes injection. So that it gets a little more complicated. And then, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Danzig. I have a follow-up, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, so, so with regards to the unit agreement, um, that may set forth things such as how the unit may be divvied up into um, spacing units, um, potentially the size of the spacing units. Um, and then as well, that would address contributions of operational costs for those cost-bearing interests, as well as how um, distribution of revenue would be handled within the unit. Do I have that correct? Um, and then my, uh, my next question is, you know, if, if they come to the commission, if, if an operator comes to the commission seeking uh, a, 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 a state unit, right, prior to having their, their commitment from the other owners, I imagine there may be some negotiation of that unit agreement during that time frame. Um, does that then have to come and be vacated or revised before the commission in order for it to go into effect at that point? AG minor. I'll, I'll take a shot at that, which is I, I don't know. I'm not, I've, I've never seen how this works in practice, but I believe it would be prudent for the operator to amend the hearing application in that case because um, a, subsection five does specify that the, the commission will approve the agreement through its order, and it is that agreement that 80% of, of each category of, of persons need to agree to. So if they agreed to a different agreement, I don't think that that, then that which the commission approved, I, I don't think that would work. So um, it would certainly be prudent, I think, for the operator to amend their application. And while I have the floor, I, I misspoke earlier, um, the, the hearing uh, notice rule for, for unit applications is 504B4, not 504B3. Thank you, AAG Minor. Commissioner Messner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner Gonzalez, if, if, it's, if you've got like a stream of questions that you wanna go with, then go ahead. Um, no, okay. A um, Couple questions then, um, and, and I've got a couple here. Um, so trying to understand a little better the, the cost sharing and the, uh, of the 80%, and is it required that all operators or uh, mineral owners um, within that 80% within the unit are required to cost share, except for those instances when someone else can cover someone's cost share for a, for a, a fee? Does that, does that question make sense? <laughs> Director Murphy, you, you have uh, courageously unmuted yourself. And for an, in courageous answer of, I think that we would need to really dig into the specifics of, of those pieces. I think Joel, I mean, did unmute, so you may have better insights. But I think, I mean, to me, the statute contemplates that there's an, a, an agreement that goes out and that agreement comes into this commission to be reviewed. And those agreements are pieces that need to be considered as part of the process without really specific dictates of the hows and whats. And I, know that Joel has a better feel and probably Jane too for the exact who can do what. And so I would invite them to provide color commentary, but there, there is an element that having the agreement come in as part of the piece to be reviewed as well um, by the commission. Hey, you Minor. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add beyond. I, I think I don't know. Um, certainly the, the statute contemplates various arrangements of sharing costs and sharing revenues, right? Um, so I, I didn't provide sort of the exact language of all the subsections of subpart four on my slide because it's pretty long and, and detailed, but um, you know, I did mention subpart F that sort of contemplates some form of, of carrying or otherwise financing, that is the direct quote. So perhaps if there are people who can't cost share, um, others can carry them or finance them and maybe that would sort of count against their, any revenue allocations they get later. Um, then also subpart D discussion discusses a provision for credits and charges, uh, charges to be made in adjustment among the owners 
for their respective investments in wells, tanks, pumps, machinery, materials, and equipment contributed to the unit operations. So I think that sort of contemplates that maybe some, some people who are owners or, or operators within the unit are contributing equipment or um, maybe pre-existing wells, right? Like um, as I if you go back to subpart one, it, it does require that someone has to have determined that there's a producing oil and gas formation here already, which so there may be an existing well that was drilled to, to determine that. So I think that the statute seems to contemplate some creative um, methods of, of cost sharing. Um, I don't know exactly what the General Assembly intended that to mean in, in 1951, but that, that seems to be what they're thinking of with the examples they provided. Commissioner Mesmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around the whole thing. Um, and along that, that same kind of line of, of questioning, help me understand, well, help me make sure that I understand that, you know, we're talking about typically a unit being a you know, fairly large piece of land, <clears throat> and there's going to be an, uh, a particular geologic formation that uh, is intended to be accessed. Uh, but at the same time, there may be portions of these um, of this unit that may or may not be accessed. But does do do does is everyone that's involved with this receive a share of, of whatever profits are occurring, even if their particular parcel is not touched, right? Okay, all right, I thought I understood that. And then as far as the 80%, I mean, I get the 80%, but we haven't really talked about the 20%. What happens to the 20% in these situations where you've got you know, 80% consent, you've got 20% that uh, I assume at that point maybe didn't consent? Um, I mean, I, I know that you could certainly have more than 80%, but are they um, just treated like they were being forced pooled? Is that AAG minor? And for the record, the question, the answer to your last question was an affirmative nodding of the heads up and down. That's right. That's right. Uh, so the answer to I think your more recent question, Commissioner Mesner, is no. Um, so, so the pooling section of the statute has very detailed provisions that you heard about last week, section 116, subpart seven, I think, um, for, for how non-consenting owners within a drilling and spacing unit um, recover royalties from production, right? So there is not an equivalent provision in, in section 118 governing non-consenting uh, uh, mineral owners within a Section 118 unit. Um, so my understanding is that uh, the part 4C of Section 118, that's, that's the part that talks about the part of the Commission's consideration has to be an allocation of the oil and gas being produced, right? So I, my understanding is that those non-consenting owners would receive essentially an equal share, um, but because there are also provisions that talk about sort of cost recovery, I, potentially if those non-consenting owners are not necessarily contributing to overall costs, perhaps um, there could be some provisions for uh, allowing lesser recovery for, from those folks. But I, I am unfortunately not really equipped to speak to the specifics. Um, so I don't know if, if Ms. Stanzik or, or Director Murphy are sort of familiar with maybe past examples where there is um, someone in that 20% non-consenting category. Commissioner Messner. Uh, thank you, that's, that's helpful. Uh, and so um, just to summarize in, uh, I mean, wh what you're saying is that the commission's gonna make that determination of the allocation, is that correct? Okay. Um, my, my other question is, um, and, and I think I already know the answer, but again, I'm just confirming that I understand is there's a geologic formation, subsurface geologic formation that we're trying to you know, fully access here. I assume there's no minimum or maximum size that can be associated with a unit. Okay. Okay, again, that's a, that's a no. <laughs> um, and, and I know that uh, Mr. Andrews, you may go into this in a, in a 
maybe a further educational session around geology, but I guess I'm curious, you know, how you would prove or, or rationalize the need, the, the subsurface geologic need to be able to pursue a unit. Um, you know, what, you know, what standards or bars need to be met in order to make this, uh, this determination. Sure. May I? Uh, yeah, Mr. Andrews, sorry, I didn't see you. Please. So, I, I mean, it, it really depends on the either structural boundaries of the unit or um, stratigraphic transitions that may go from a sandstone into a, a different reservoir. Um, but I mean, the, the main thing is these are usually fields that are well characterized. Um, so the operators, you know, have seismic or other data um, to uh, define the extents of that sandstone body, if, if it's a sandstone reservoir. And they generally have lots of drilling data and production data uh, to be able to tell, um, you know, how much more oil is recoverable uh, from the unit. And that would be part of the application. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and last question, um, I think, is, uh, When so I mean you've got the the, the mineral owners, uh, you've got the operators, um, you've also got the surface owners, and the surface owners, um, you know, understanding that you've got the unit and that they'll be going through an OGDP process with, you know, twos and two A's and 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 you know all the rules r related to that. Is there anything that needs to be in the unit application that? Um, clarifies that there is going to be the ability to get the surface agreements in place in order to be able to continue to move forward in the recovery, you know, of the minerals within the unit. Hey, AG Minor. No, Commissioner Mesner. Um, nothing in Section 118 discusses surface agreements or, or surface owners. So, um, as Director Murphy said, sort of at the, the end of the staff presentation, those. Those surface considerations are still very important, but they're they're handled through the OGDP process, not through the Section 118 process. So, um, and, and and I get that. At what point? Um, I mean, I guess it's probably not really realistic, but um, I mean, I guess it could be problematic that you create a unit and then not have. Um, the ability to be able to access that. And if that was the case, can you remove that unit or remove the authorization for that unit because they are unable to get the surface owner agreements in place to actually drill? Hey, AG Minor. If I may question Mesner, I, I, I think that scenario is very unlikely given because the 80% the approval has to be from both the mineral owners and the the essentially the operators right um I, I'm, I'm simplifying the terminology here but presumably um the, i i can't really imagine a situation where um there would not be a legal ability to access those minerals um uh, among the full 80 percent of, of operators and, and mineral owners um because our, our legal system does make the mineral estate dominant right so um, I, I think that there would very likely be a legal ability to access those minerals um, and that, in fact, there would likely be some sort of pre-existing agreement with the surface owner or that uh, at least some of those mineral owners would also potentially own the surface. So um, I, I can't really contemplate a situation where that would arise. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, this question goes to kind of how the unit operates once it's approved and and the appropriate written consent has been granted um, or issued and and kind of what happens if development continues at the regular pace and and goes to full development. What does the unit look like? But what happens if development stalls um, under a unit agreement or or under a, a an agreement a unit approved by us? And the operative word I'm going for is contraction, um, but I just want to get some more explanation on that whole process. Um, Murphy? Yeah, I'll, I'll 
hand this over quickly. Um, I think contraction is an option as contemplated if it's contemplated by the unit agreement, right? Um, and how that would operate. So it, to me, it's um, there's a lot of this statute that sets out the big picture process to get there, but we need to look at how how it actually operates and apply based on the unit agreement and the information that comes forward and the ultimate order that the commission adopts. And these are all pieces that need to be considered, right? Um, and and kind of to close close the loop on Commissioner Mesner's question about what happens if twenty percent are non consenting. There's a there's a chance that you do have 100% consent is that they would be compensated as contemplated by the unit agreement and the provisions that Joel mentioned are the authority for the commission to adjust that in accordance with what comes forward. So um, I don't know, Ms. Stanzik, if you want to add anything about contraction more specifically, but to me, there's, this is a lot about, you'll have to look individually at units as they come to you and, and think about things like contraction and the unit agreement and what it contemplates and what the mineral, mineral and operators have um, have joined in um, in support of or in opposition to a particular unit proposal. Ms. Danzig? Um, thank you. I, given that the unit, the, the boundaries of the unit, and then the, the plan to operate it is based on, is is all technical. It's based on the anticipated performance and behavior of the reservoir and whatever uh, methodology the operator is proposing to increase the ultimate recovery of oil and gas. Um, so I'm trying to imagine when a contraction would make sense. Um, I would think it would only make sense if they're initial understanding turned out to be wrong. Um, and I would think that would require amending the, uh, the, uh, the unit agreement, the whole, the operating plan for the, for the unit. Thank you for that. Uh, further questions? Not on, on, on that, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for the answer. I think that might be something that we're going to see a little more detail in and, and really get a better understanding when we actually see a unit application and a unit agreement in front of us um, to see how that operates. Um, but thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Any wrap up from staff on this topic? Just a thanks for the opportunity to address um, the questions and the issues in a pretty perspective, broad-based way and um, yeah. continue to follow along. If you do want a more detailed engineering um, presentation, I think that's something that Dave and his team could get queued up sometime later this spring or early summer. Um, anticlines are fascinating, but we certainly need to set aside the right amount of time to talk about them and pr prepare for that presentation. Sure. Well, um, on behalf of the commission, I uh, want to thank staff for once again um, taking a difficult topic and presenting it to us in an educated manner. Um, the slides that we've seen today, I would anticipate, would make their way to our uh, website so that we have access to them and our stakeholders have access to them as well. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Director Murphy. Um, all right, with that, um, I think we are done with our discussions around um, state units and state unitization. Um, we still had the one public commenter, uh, that was Mr. Phil Doe, but I'm not seeing him in the meeting. Uh, hearings manager, Thomas, um, are you able to find or locate Mr. Doe? I have not been able to at this time. Okay, Mr. Doe, if you're in the meeting and you would like to have your three minutes, please raise your hand or otherwise inform Mr. Thomas. And while we're giving him that opportunity, uh, the last item on our agenda this morning was comments from commissioners. So do any commissioners have any comments that they'd like to make? Commissioner Gonzalez? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, it, our, our, we have an upcoming rulemaking as dictated by 
um, SB 19181 with regard to financial assurance. And we've talked about that here in our, in our hearings and um, we're all working on that diligently, independently as commissioners. And I've, I've had um, several stakeholders reach out to me and kind of, you know, bend my ear on, on ideas that they have, on concepts, and all of those conversations have been very helpful and have helped shape, um, you know, my understanding of the current situation with financial assurance and potential avenues um, for, for, the, for the upcoming rulemaking. And I just wanted to solicit um, and, and suggest that any other stakeholders that, that have ideas that they want to share with me, um, please reach out, set up a time to talk. Um, I'd love to hear from you. I um, really want to make sure that, uh, that I have a full perspective and, and suite of knowledge on this topic. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. Please don't hesitate. Um, my email and contact is on the website. So reach out to me. We'll set up a time. We'll, we'll talk about it. And uh, just wanted to throw that out there. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I think that goes for all of us. If there are stakeholders out there that want to, you know, have conversations specifically on financial assurance or any topic really, uh, but certainly we are, uh, you know, we are starting to all educate ourselves and dive into um, financial assurance and the different concepts and lay of the land you know, around that. Um, and so, yeah, I appreciate that Commissioner Gonzalez. I think it's important for all of us. Um, and the, you know, the other thing, I'll just give a quick update as far as what I've, what I've been doing here. And I think that's something that, you know, I think w would be helpful for all of us to do occasionally and just kind of update each other on, you know, what we've been doing uh, between hearings. And um, I have been talking with a number of different stakeholders around financial assurance. Um, I think that it is a difficult topic. I think that um, the more information, the better on that. Um, but uh uh, and then I've started to um, set up different meetings with local government organizations and local governments to just uh, give a briefing on, you know, what has occurred over the last six months with the different rulemakings, um, as well as update them on upcoming rulemakings and certainly making myself available to uh, them for any questions that they may have um, you know, about what we've done or what we're going to be doing. Um, and so uh, over the next couple of weeks, I've got a pretty full slate of conversations um, with the different local governments and local government organizations. Um, and so that's been, that's been good. And I'm looking forward to those conversations. It's much easier now actually to, to pack the house with meetings uh, over Zoom rather than driving all over the state meeting with different folks, although um, driving all over the state is much more entertaining than sitting in my living room. So um, that's all I've got. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, speaking to the financial assurances, um, Director Murphy, I mean, I'm gonna put you on the spot here, but um, I know that you, know, you and I have had some discussions and I think you've had discussions with each of the commissioners individually. Um, could it be possible that we could get a kind of current lay of the land, what is financial assurances 101 in current state uh, by say next week for our hearing um, so that stakeholders can all sort of listen in and get a sense of that as we start to tee up the financial assurances discussion? Chair, the short answer is yes, we can make that happen. Um, I, think, I think it's opportune and um, a good way to open the door to kind of the different resources that are out there. I'll work with staff to get um, a web page up and running um, for financial assurance, just because it'd be nice to have a repository of information about it and um, be in a space to start an informed dialogue with all everybody. So yes. Excellent, thank you for letting me put you on that spot. So we'll look forward to getting that financial assurances current state of play uh, next week. Um, our 52 participants have been so informed, which is awesome. Um, other commissioners with comments at this time? Commissioner Hackett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to let folks know, I don't currently have a comprehensive legislative update like Director Gibbs was able to provide this morning, um, but I will be meeting with um, Tricia Oath, who's the CDPHE Boards and Commissions Manager, Director, um, and she'll be providing a legislative update on CDPHE priorities this Friday. And if there's anything relevant to the COGCC commissioners, I'll make sure to share that at next 
Wednesday's hearing, so just stay tuned on that. And then this is kind of just general, um, I, I don't think we can say thank you enough to staff for all the great work you're doing on implementing these new rules. Um, I have tuned in to some of the operator trainings and it's, it's impressive the amount of content that you're putting out, how quickly you're putting it out and how high quality it all is. Um, I have reached out to a couple of the new OGLA staff to let them know I think they're just doing a phenomenal job with that and um, just wanted to restate that to any other COGCC staff who are listening in. You're, you're doing a phenomenal job and we appreciate learning this process along with you. So, so thank you very much. Agree. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Hackett, for that point. Um, other final comments? All right. Um, with that, I think we are through our agenda and we would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Looks like we're adjourned. We'll see you next week for the financial assurances uh, update as well as our general agenda. Bye, everybody. <laughs>